Okay, so uh, I'm Vinay Gupta of a thing called the Hexier Project. And most of the time when you hear people talk about their projects, the projects are basically uh, se semi-centralized. There's a certain sense of political solidarity. There's a certain sense that the project is fundamentally about people. The Hexier Project is none of those things. It's a project which is entirely about things. Right? This is a Hexier, and it is the world's cheapest, worst house. 12 sheets of plywood, five pieces of two by four, 160 deck screws, uh, US price is about $86, UK price about 150 quid. It lasts several years in the outdoors, and it is a piece of shit, right? But per person per year, it's 20% of the price of a disaster relief tent, and it's vastly more comfortable because it gives you thermal control, particularly if you're in areas which are too hot, or if you build them out of insulation in places which are too cold. And it's an example of something called open source appropriate technology, which is a very kind of small scale global movement to try and fix the material base that causes the world to be in the way that the world is. So most of the political decisions that are made in the world are fundamentally made when you pick your engineering solution. You decide that you'll use fiber optic cables. You therefore wind up with undersea cables which are subject to monitoring by the state. You decide that you're going to use coal-powered uh, coal power plants. You therefore wind up with an enormous amount of CO2 emission, but you also wind up with a coal industry, which then becomes globalized. The material base, which is obviously familiar to Marxists, is fundamentally what defines our political choices. You can only choose between things which are possible. You cannot choose to do something which is impossible unless you're willing to do the engineering work to make it possible. Right now, the world as it stands is fundamentally broken at a civil engineering level, hence climate change. It's fundamentally broken at a civil engineering level, hence a billion or so people with no access to clean water, a billion or so people with no access to, or very limited access to food. These are fundamentally engineering problems, and it doesn't matter what kind of politics you have, those engineering problems will persist. So the first thing I want to say to you is, how many of you in the room are engineers? Right? Tiny handful, three or four people, right? Um, the rest of you better understand that all of the political choices you make are only within the bounds of the engineering which has been done. You cannot choose to do something which the engineers have not made possible, and most of your choices are completely constrained. <coughs> Politicization of engineering is the Buckminster Fuller agenda. Does anybody know who Buckminster Fuller was? So, right, handful of hands. Buckminster Fuller is the guy that we should have followed instead of Marx, right? Fuller simply said, fix the material base, invest in the engineering, make the world's problems first soluble and then easily soluble, and then build on that base whatever kind of solution you want so that everybody has stable peace and abiding happiness. Right? We've tried reorganizing society and playing around with the kind of monkey-centric power gaming, which has been our species' nature for the last two million years, and it turns out that there is no configuration of monkey-centric power gaming that allows you to power your civilization without emitting CO2 other than fixing the engineering base. If you don't do the engineering, you're going to get lousy solutions. And right now, the progressive movement as a whole has absolutely no interest and scant regard for engineering as the source of both all of the significant problems, witness nuclear weapons and global warming, right? the enormous death toll from cars. All oh, this is engineering. <coughs> progressive movement historically has no interest in engineering. It's just about power. right? Political power to try and make people do things one way or another way, rather than engineering power to change the set of possibilities we have into a set of possibilities that we like more. Right. We've completely ignored the engineering base. Have you ever heard anybody stand up and campaign for better engineering? <coughs> right. Doesn't happen. Right? All the stuff about global warming, all we ever do is talk about policy. Does anybody stand up there and talk about the engineering side? My God, we really need to do this and this and this, these pieces of engineering, these five pieces of research. We need to raise the money, move the money, fix the problem. No. What we talk about is regulation. We talk about policy. We talk about power. We talk about money. We never talk about where the problem actually is. And this is an 
huge cultural legacy that we have from the struggle for control of British society that happened around the time of the Industrial Revolution. As the basis for the generation of wealth moved from being feudal aristocracy, <coughs> sorry, feudal aristocracy, essentially we were run by the children of the Normans, to being the new industrial class, which was largely a bunch of northerners like Brunel, right? You know, all of that kind of revolutionary stuff. It was coming out of the black country, right? Birmingham. Inside of that power struggle, uh, British society figured out how to delegitimize engineering as a position from which one could exert political power as a way of protecting the feudal, under, the feudal landed aristocracy. So since that point, oh, certainly, sir. So <laughs> what happens is that there's a power struggle between the feudal aristocracy and the new kind of industrial uh, captains of industry, the Burnells and all the rest of this, for control of British society. Is it going to be about inherited class or is it going to be about manufacturing wealth and manufacturing power? Right? And inside of that struggle, the feudal aristocracy manages to delegitimize the right of the engineers to exert political influence from the position of being good at engineering. <coughs> um, this is something that you know, is critical to their ability to defend their privilege, and it results in us not having an engineering class with any political power. Right? Sir Tim Berners-Lee invents the web, which most people you know, use, every day for hours. Does he have any substantial amount of political clout? Is he celebrated as being about the most important person to come out of the UK? No, right? Sports guys, absolutely. Politicians, absolutely. Creators of enormously powerful global artifacts that shape everything that we do, largely unknown. You've heard the name, but there's no substantial status associated with it, right? So the point that I wanna make here is this you are completely incapable of solving most of the fundamental problems in the world unless you are an engineer. You can do nothing substantial about global warming unless you can actually deploy new solar panels or other equivalent technologies. Unless you're capable of building a 200 kilogram car, you are helpless. <coughs> doesn't matter who you elect, doesn't matter who you vote for, doesn't matter what you campaign on, it's not going to get fixed. The solutions that you could deploy, like bicycles, right? A bunch of engineers develop those, not you, right? So if you want to fix the world's problems, firstly, start figuring out how to selectively empower the engineers who are building the stuff that will fix the world's problems, right? You can't do it. You are as helpless as somebody trying to take out their own appendix. You can't fix the global power structures. Right? You certainly can't fix the energy distribution. You can't do anything about food distribution. You can't figure out how to grow new food. Right? You are a de-skilled, helpless mob. <laughs> right? And you exist in a culture which looks at the people that have the skills to fix the world as if they were second-class citizens. Right? Look at the absolute uh, you know, uh, decimation of the culture of the nerds, which is happening online right now, under the name Gamergate. Right? You take the only people that have the skills to actually repair the society that you're in and you decimate their culture because you don't like their values. Actually, if you want this world fixed, these are the people that you need to persuade to your cause. These are the people that you need to fund and support. In the past 10 years, the open source world has created a free operating system roughly equivalent to Windows or Mac OS called Linux and it's more or less solved the global education problem by creating Wikipedia. We now have organized free content that anybody can have to educate themselves, and we're rapidly on the way to building the end-use devices that people can use in their villages and in their slums to get an education. In that time, the progressive movement has done nothing but lose ground on every substantial agenda, and the open source movement can still get zero political voice or political support from the rest of the progressive movement, right? The people that are actually solving the world's problems because they are engineers and therefore without political status get zero support from a movement that is rapidly losing ground on every single critical area. It is broken to the core. You cannot fix it. You don't have the skills. The people who do have the skills are making incredibly rapid progress on education, on health, on energy, and on everything else, and we can get zero political support from you. It's broken. 
Stop worrying about the bloody politicians. Start supporting the engineers that are building a better world that you can actually live in right now. Stop messing around, <laughs> right? 200 years ago, right, 100 years ago, Marx gets started, not 200 years, 100 and something years ago, Marx gets started, or Marxism as a political force gets started about we're going to emit wealth from factories and we want to figure out who controls the wealth emitted from the factories. Does it belong fundamentally to the workers in the factories or the capitalists that created the stuff, uh, that bought the machinery, or does it belong to the designers of the things in the factory? Capital, labor, talent was the old tripod, right? Right now, all of the activity politically is around fighting against capital. Nothing is going into supporting talent, right? And it's the other fight. We've done unionization. One of my grand, uh, great, 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 great grandparents was apparently avoided becoming a tall panel martyr by about this much, right? We've done huge amounts of struggle between labor and capital. And it turns out that we lost and we're at a stalemate. The next round of the struggle is between talent and capital, and talent in the form of engineers are winning very fast against capital. The open source software movement is decimating everything that it touches. We are taking things that used to be extremely scarce goods and making them globally available to any human being at zero cost. And we've done it for knowledge, we've done it for software, we're doing it for cryptography, we're about to do it for financial instruments through things like Bitcoin, subsequent project called Ethereum that I work with, right? So I want you to really heavily reconsider everything think you think you know about how to win this game and about what victory looks like. Because if all you're going to do is get increasing amounts of influence and control over a system with horrific engineering, welcome to running a planet with six or seven degrees of warming while you all sit on your hands and wonder how we wound up in this mess, right? It's only going to come because we put political power in the hands of the engineers and scientists that know how to solve these things and then listen to them when they tell us what to do. I absolutely deny the right of a de-skilled political class to instruct the engineers about how to run the world anymore. And if democracy will not put engineers in charge because people will not vote for them, you're all going to die. <laughs> right? And if you think I'm joking, wait until you see nanotechnology and biotechnology and the issues around regulating and controlling these things. We're 10 or 15 years away from being able to take a text file containing the gene sequence of smallpox, put it into a machine and get a live virus out the other side of it. Right? The people that you're putting in power, even the progressive people that you're putting in power are apes. They have no ability to understand the world that has been created. <laughs> Even your side have no ability to understand the world that has been created. They are delegitimized as a power class. So I want you to go home and I want you to really think who runs the world, who decides what systems we build and what systems we don't build, who has the necessary skill and refined understanding to have control of these systems. The only option available to create a world which works for everybody and given the threats from nanotechnology and biotechnology which survives, is to figure out how to put the right engineers in a position of having political and governmental power. Not lawyers, not people that look good on TV, not a bunch of glib bastards from Eton, right? British society took the wrong fork. We should have gone with Brunel and the rest of those guys and disenfranchised that power class when we had the chance. It is not too late. <laughs>